Good morning, everybody. Hope springs eternal, and nowhere does it spring more vigorously than in the US. On election day, the world was in shock. Certainly the Netherlands was, or the UK for that matter. And yet, how long did it take in the US to take all this on board? The Dow, during the day, or at least before it opened, 800 points down on the futures. I think it took about, all, about five minutes for you to get on board and to say, you know what, Mr. Trump, maybe it's not going to be that bad. In actual fact, he may deliver. We may get some real change. And equity markets rallied. So yours is an optimism that uh, is harder to find across the rest of the world. So we get to my presentation there, and I need a clicker for that. Um, the title is Business as Unusual. I think you'll find that a theme that resounds, because business has been profoundly unusual. In the background, and throughout this presentation, I'll be using a Dutch artist called Mr. Escher. He's known for his mathematical constructs, mathematical mazes in which the exit is hard to find. And that's exactly the way most central bankers must be feeling, the way you may be feeling. How do we get out of this difficult maze? A couple of topics I want to discuss with you. The global economy, of course, interest rates in that context, and the interest rate, the whole lower for longer paradigm is very much in question at the moment. So we'll talk a bit about that and the role of central banks therein. We'll talk about Brexit, we'll talk about Trump, we'll talk about populism. And populism is not a dirty word in my book. It isn't that easy. Populism is a form of democracy. The populists are better at grasping some of the key issues out there with the people. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about the difference between focusing on the messenger and his hairstyle and the message, which may be real. We'll talk briefly about China. But before we do all this, there's a few conditions that I work under. So I'll share those with you. A couple of weeks ago, Rajiv gave me a call and he said, Jan, two conditions. One, you have to be positive. Two, our clients like forecasts. Right. So there will be forecasts, and there will at least be one positive slide in this presentation, and I will announce it when it happens. <laughs> there's a third thing as well, which is a, something I added myself, and that is there's a disclaimer. No children were harmed in the making of this presentation. And th this will make sense during the presentation. I'll come back to it. Right, if you all agree with that, then let's start with the global economy. You may not be that aware of it, but we have apparently had a recovery for eight to nine years. And it's a lackluster affair. And to be fair, the US has probably done a little bit better than the rest of the world. But globally, it's a lackluster affair. It's a recovery that's supported by two things, or was supported by two things. It's still supported by central bank liquidity, but that's definitely under pressure. So that ice layer that's supporting is melting. And it was up until sort of two, three years ago, very much supported by rapid emerging market growth. Particularly China, but to be fair, all emerging markets were doing well. That has, of course, also been under a lot of pressure. And that ice layer is melting. So if I look at the global recovery, there's quite a few risks to what is already a lackluster recovery. We're on thin ice, if you may, and I've listed here some of the regions, but I could have added Brazil, of course, as well here, and other countries. All these countries are trying to achieve quite lofty goals. The Fed wants to normalize rates. China wants 6.5% to 7% growth, and in the Eurozone, Japan, we would like 2% inflation. And yet, in all of these countries, this seems quite elusive and quite risky to achieve. So you can see some in the upcoming years that some of these risks will actually materialize. And the recovery is actually a little bit getting longer the tooth, which is one of the reasons why the Fed is trying to normalize policy, of course. That brings us to some scenario analysis, because when you're not quite sure, you do scenario analysis. So we cracked the models for you, did some hard thinking, and this is where that disclaimer comes in. I'm going to show you our base case scenario, and remember, no children were harmed in the making of this presentation. So it looks decidedly difficult, it's modeling through in the end, you reach the end, but it looks a bit painful too. The disclaimer was added because I was a couple of months ago in Geneva, where a gentleman after the presentation stood up during the Q&A and he said, maybe this is funny in Germany or the Netherlands. He was painting with a broad brush there. He wasn't quite sure where I was from. <laughs> but in the UK, he said, 
We don't think it's very funny when children get hurt in bankers' presentations. <laughs> so, I decided to wisely shut up on that note. So, but this is our base case scenario. Difficult to get across, a bit painful, but we do get there. So muddling through. Worst case scenario is decidedly different. In the worst case scenario, this is your car. <laughs> right. Best case scenario, worst case scenario, contractually. Here's the positive slide. And there is a serious note to this. When you're at the bottom of the chasm, it is very difficult to see the way up. It's easy to come up with all these stories why it will remain bad, etc. But things can change. And typically, you do find that way up. So what could be the catalyst for that? Well, one catalyst is to go to the harder problem. The harder problem is that we haven't had sustainable wage increases for a while. So if we can reverse that, if somehow, for example, Mr. Trump or other people can figure out how to raise wages more sustainably, that could be a big difference. What if low energy prices could be actually spent up? So far, people haven't done it. They've saved it up. And I'm not quite sure how long low energy prices will last now that OPEC seems to have a little bit of sack together. But yeah, that could happen. Let's get a bit more fuzzy. What if we could all just get along and globally, we would think global rather than locally? Not exactly what's happening at the moment, but hey, this is the positive slide, remember? And something that may be happening is, of course, that with all these low interest rates, governments will actually borrow and they'll spend it up. So here you go, a couple of ways on which you can get out of this and things to watch. Right, if you're a pessimist, but you do see at some point wages increase, could be a sign we're at a breaking point there in a positive sense. I said business is unusual, but maybe I should make the case. Why is it unusual? Well, it's quite unusual when you see the following things. Negative yields. And I don't think we really ponder enough about that. You have to pay the, the government for the privilege of lending them money. It's quite insane if you think of it. Helicopter money, once an academic, esoteric topic, is now in the mainstream press. And currency volatility, it's not just limited to the emerging markets. We see it in the major economies as well. And of course, talk of a global tide against globalization, where previously globalization was associated with all the good things. So it's the world upside down. And that begs the question, how did we ever get here? And where are we going from here? So we won't be doing too much history. Relax but a little bit. This is part and parcel of it. This chart shows globalization in an index across the globe since the 1970s. And gently, the clock ticks along all the way to 2010 in this case. And you see the world map getting more and more blue, which means it gets more globalized. We're approaching 1989, the fall of the Berlin Wall, and bang, the rest of the world goes blue. And the deeper blue it gets, the more globalized the world is. And of course, for a long time, we associate this with progress. We were growing the pie. And economists would tell you that, sure, people win, people lose. So you have to compensate the losers. Economics is not really a great study or science in terms of figuring out how to compensate it. They skip over that usually. But this was progress. To use Mr. Escher, if you'll allow me, people seem to be walking up in that labyrinth. And yet there was an elephant in the room. And with a little bit of imagination, you can see the elephant in this chart, its trunk. What is the key essence of this chart? And it's, it's a fairly famous chart. So you may have seen this before. It's certainly not something we came up with, but it's widely cited. This shows income growth over a period of two decades, divided by the very poorest, so in deciles, but the very poorest on the left, all the way to the very richest. So on the left-hand side is Africa, going through the emerging markets to the OECD, and on the far right end there side is the US. And you can see that over those 20 years, an enormous amount of people have been lifted out of abject poverty by globalization. So that's on that body of the elephant. You can see that the rich have definitely become richer. But you can also see that in the OECD, the working class there, wages have been relatively stagnant. The income has been relatively stagnant. So there's a lot of tension. I've drawn a few arrows here to depict that kind of tension. The tension internally between the 
haves and the haves nots in the wealthy countries. The attention also then between the rising middle class in Asia, which benefits, but is perceived to be taking the jobs away of the OECD countries and the working class there. And we have to be aware that it's not just about absolute income differences here. Because the whole argument that people are worse off now than 30 years ago, that, that is not true. But it's also very much about relative perceptions. This whole idea that if you buy that new car and you pull it up on your driveway and your neighbor just happens to buy just that little nicer car, you're just not going to be as happy. That's the way it works. And we may not like it. We want, to, we want to strive to be better people. But it's the way, the way it works. And it means that when you get to vote, you may not be happy. So this is at the heart of some of these tensions about globalization. So again, in Escher, people have been going up, but people have also been going down. We've grown the pie, but we've been not as good at distributing it, and definitely perceptions are that way. So I'll use a little bit of US data, because it's simply the best available data, to make a further point here on the what and why. On the left-hand side, you see what's been happening. See, stagnant, real, stagnant nominal wages are not exactly new here. The median male wage since the 50s has been moving more or less sideways. Labor productivity has been rising steadily. But labor has not been able to capture that. But up until 2008, they weren't too worried about it because they were confident enough to borrow the difference. So I have that here in the chart. Massive borrowing took place prior to the global financial crisis. After the global financial crisis, people deleveraged. They're simply not as confident about their job, the future. They're not willing to borrow the difference. And therefore, the flat wage has become a real constraint to them. They feel that they're no longer part of that dream. A bit cheekily, on the right-hand side, I've linked how a global rising inequality seems to be quite going hand in hand with globalization. So again, the perception of people is that globalization favors the wealthy, the top 20%, rather than the 80% who rely on wages only to get by and can't rely on asset price appreciation. Adam Smith was cited yesterday. And Rajiv made a good point that Adam Smith wasn't only about free trade, and he's much misinterpreted and misquoted at times as well. Here in this chart, we have on the orange side wages, so compensation for labor. On the blue, we have the reward for capital, profit. Look at the axis. This is since the 50s. So this is a big period, 50, 60 years. You can see here very clearly that profits have been rising in the past decades, whereas the compensation for labor wages has been driven down. And this is a problem because 80% of people rely on wages only to get by. And of course, you think in terms of marginal propensity to consume, it's quite clear that you can only eat so many hamburgers a day. So it's a problem when you don't see wage increases in the lower end, the lower strata, because consumption simply suffers. And hand in hand with that, people are not willing to invest. If they're also offered low interest rates, they may actually engage differently companies in leverage buyouts, playing the stock market, because all of that seems to be more rewarding and less risk than actually doing innovative investments. So that's where another quote from Adam Smith comes into play. Profits are always highest in those countries fastest going to ruin. In other words, if you're in a country where profits are truly very high, that comes to such a detriment of labor that you see that back in actual consumption patterns. And it's not good news for companies long run either. Worrisomely in this, to this extent is that not just do we have worries about how the pie is being distributed? And people perceive it to be unfair, to use a US term, rigged. We also are at risk that the pie is no longer growing so fast. This is productivity over the past seven years. Now, seven years not necessarily makes a trend, but it is a reasonably long period. And you can see it's definitely lower than previous periods. So productivity as a whole has collapsed somewhat. And this may be linked to the fact that productive investments are simply not as rewarding. It's more rewarding to play the stock market. It's more rewarding to play the housing market, all of which are unproductive, right? because the value of a house doesn't change. still a roof under which you shelter. And a company doesn't truly become 
worth more to society just because we print more money and pump it into the equity market. And all of this is taking place under one condition, and that is the most accommodative monetary policy in our history. So that's something to bear in mind. We have all of this to show for it, and we're doing this much. It's quite amazing. In my team, we had a little bit of a race about this. So I shot the first one across the bow with this chart, showing that since 1988, interest rates indeed are at their lowest level in these five major economies, ranging from Switzerland all the way to the Eurozone, the Fed, the UK. So not to be outdone, our Eurozone strategist, Elwin de Groot, came out pretty quickly and was able to produce this chart on the Netherlands since the 1700s. Interest rates are very low. People are competitive in the team, so we have Mike Every, our Asian strategist, coming out with this chart. Going back 5,000 years, all the way to the Sumer Empire, he was able to show the interest rates truly are very, very low. And the key point is they're so low, and yet we talk about this like lust recovery, of course. So what are central banks doing? Forget the history, what are they doing? Why, why are we here? Well, in part, the politicians don't want to do the heavy lifting. And they found out that they can have a lot of leverage on the central banks. Right? They haven't been the best of regulators, so the politicians have smartly leveraged that they need to do the heavy lifting. And central banks are buying everything. They're buying sovereign bonds, they're buying mortgages, mortgage bonds, they're buying equity street ETFs, they're buying corporate bonds in some of these districts. You can see their balance sheets, they're on the left hand side, gradually expanding. So there's an enormous amount of liquidity. And where they move, they make real liquidity in the market deteriorate, some of the middlemen disappear. And there's a very clear sort of modus operandi here at work. So let's look at that, because it's very easy to bash central bankers. They're not in the audience, so they're an easy target. But why would they be doing this? And in part, it is keeping all the plates spinning. They would say, listen, we have little choice. We have to do something, because the politicians aren't doing it, and the world economy is in trouble. We have to do something. But to us, it also looks very much like drinking to avoid a hangover. So when it doesn't work, you simply do more of it. And that's what we've seen with quantitative easing. Is this a victimless crime? Why am I so worried about this, Jan? I mean, low interest rates, good for everybody, right? Well, it's not a victimless crime. On the left-hand side, self-servingly, it's not the best environment for banks. Negative interest rates, flat yield curves, hurts long-term profitability. Medium-term, more question marks. We've published some research about that. Longer-term, no question marks. And you might say, well, that's not my problem. But the healthy financial sector is probably everyone's trouble, a problem. It seemed to be a problem, at least in 2008, when it wasn't. That's one. But more to the point, you don't have to have a sympathy with your banker too much. On the right-hand side, you see where it hurts all of us. Pensions. With the risk-free rate of return almost non-existent, how can you save for your retirement? And as you can't save for your retirement, how can you be confident to spend? So the unintended consequences of this type of very loose monetary policy are starting to really accumulate. To speak in terms of Escher, everything is more correlated than fragile now at the moment. People are going up and down, but the system itself is fragile. And that's where the political backlash begins. This is Larry Summers, the man who didn't get the job at the Fed. He gives speeches, so I lifted for free a quote from one of these speeches. I thought it was a good one, so that's why I'm sharing it here with you. There's a revolt on the way against global integration because of the perception that it's a project by the elites, for the elites, with little consideration for the man in the street. That's the perception, at least. But to be fair, if your wage increases were flat, non-existence for the past 10 years, you might actually think so too. But we don't have to use Larry Summers, a contemporary. We can go back to history, to a man that doesn't figure very often in bankers' presentations, Karl Marx. Karl Marx was a big proponent of free trade. He thought free trade was the best thing since sliced bread. Because surely, he said, free trade will create such inequality that the revolution must follow. Now, 
I'm not saying we're going to have a revolution. In any case, he would have been 150 years off if we do. But he did see the problems associated with unfettered free trade. And the whole dogma, the dogmatic approach that free trade by itself is great and protectionism is bad, there are a lot of shades of gray here, to put it mildly. So that political backlash is on the way. And this is important to bear in mind. Now you may say, Jan, that's fine, but to be honest, what is really going to change? Right. As we sit here, past 50, 60 years have been very stable. We've seen globalization, we've seen the rules not really change radically from that perspective. It's a Spanish university that produces sort of a liberty index. So how free are you truly to conduct your business? And throughout history, you'll see in the 19th century, the Pax Britannica, very long time, a stable period, interrupted by the period around World War I, the run-up to it slightly afterwards. Then again, some freedom, and then World War II came around. And then we had an unprecedented period, almost parallel to the 19th century, of again, a lot of freedom. A high score here means a free economy. Now, I'm not saying we're going to have World War III, just to make that clear. But the point here is that the rules can change quite dramatically. So when people say they're going to change the rules, that least bears attention to watch them. I think we had a few people promise that at least. The rules are also a bit vague because if I list to you the rules of doing good business, it'd be probably something like this at a macro level. The independence of central banks, a small government, free movement of goods, services, people, and capital. And you'd be like, yeah, yeah, I get that. Economics 101, I got this. This textbook, I got it down. No problem. Jan, I'm with you this time. And yet, these are not always compatible. Small example. Free movement of people and a small government didn't really seem to work out in the case of the UK and ultimately informed the Brexit vote. Quick explanation on that front. Well, let's do a thorough analysis on Brexit. All right. Brace yourself. This, in my mind, is Brexit. <laughs> and if we go for history, I came across this meme and I thought it was very appropriate. Colonizes half the world, then complains about immigrants. <laughs> Tongue in cheek, but there's a truth to this. Immigration was the key issue in Brexit. When you go in Europe right now, the dissatisfaction that people have, the economy is somewhere at number five. It's immigration up front, refugee flows, how we're handling that. But there is economic reasoning behind it as well. And the economic reasoning is that there's only so much social security available if you have small government, but you do let more people in, then what's available to every person per head becomes less. So there is an economic reasoning behind it. Right. Now let's spend at least some time about how is this all going to end. And you will probably have had, if you're interested in Brexit and you have business there, you probably have had these consultant presentations and I can do one for half an hour, but we're going to do it a lot shorter. Because we already had a country leave the Eurozone before, or well, to be precise, it was the European Economic Association. In 1985, Greenland decided that was about it. They had enough and they were leaving. And it took them two years to negotiate the departure. And it went to the wire. It was a last minute affair. That two minutes before midnight, they struck a deal. They only had one topic to discuss, fishing quotas. The UK has an enormous list to discuss. So if you want to know if this is going to end well, just look at Greenland. This is going to be very, very difficult to achieve. Should you care? Well, unless you have chosen the UK as your big distribution center, you probably won't. We were briefly on the impression it was a big deal, but it isn't a big deal for the rest of the world. It is, though, important to watch whether we'll have contagion towards the rest of Europe. And the rest of Europe is a bit complicated. We've listed here parties that are explicitly anti-EU and anti-Europe. Euro. We've listed parties that are anti-Euro or just anti-EU or only Eurosceptic. This is how complicated it gets. The main takeaway here, though, is the right-hand side. It is how sentiment has changed since the financial market crisis. The UK actually saw an improvement of sentiment towards the EU as one of the few countries. So it is not just the economy that did the best in that period. 
it had a change in sentiment in a positive sense, and still it voted to be out. So that clearly leads to some risks there. And things to watch in the upcoming years, definitely on the European side. The Italian referendum on the 4th of December in Austria. We have German, the Dutch, the French elections all coming up. So there is more room for populist backlash. And while all have their own idiosyncrasies, all have their unique backgrounds, that similar theme where voter dissatisfaction is showing up matters. Voters feel disenfranchised. And when I say disenfranchised, it means that voters are pissed off. And they're willing, like we've seen in the past, they're willing to roll the dice. They're willing to take a gamble on what it all means. Let's bring it closer to home here, the US. Here too, I've listed again these business as usual rules. So you have free movement of labor, free movement of goods and small government, but it didn't really seem to work and at least informs the election of Mr. Trump. And I was making a joke about the hairdo, um, but it's a key point here, right? We focus too much on the messenger, but the message they carry about globalization leading to disenfranchisement, leading to a voter backlash, needing to be addressed in some way, shape or form, is real. So what do we expect from Mr. Trump? And I can imagine you're all a little bit tired of it. You certainly don't need a Dutchman to come and tell you all about US politics. You got CNN for that or Fox News, depending on what you want to hear. Um, but very briefly, the fiscal impact that we're going to see is probably real. And that will be helping the economy. But it's balanced in our mind by all the uncertainty around trade. We're not even very negative on the trade outcome, but we think it's going to be very messy. There's going to be a lot of threats. The way Mr. Trump seems to operate, and the way in any case these deals get done, is that he wants to be as irrational and harsh and out there and bullying as he can. And he thinks then that the trading partners will cave in and he will get a good deal. And to be fair, this is possible. Ronald Reagan did it in the 80s. Trade wars don't only have losers, they can have winners too. Ronald Reagan extracted from the Japanese voluntary export restraints in the automobile industry. That was real. So Trump can get this done, but the way there is quite volatile. That can weigh on global growth, and therefore we believe that for the next 12 months, the sugar rush, as someone called it yesterday, I thought that was a great term, that currently the markets are on, is going to be challenged. So if you look at our interest rate forecasts, they're actually lower in 12 months' time, and quite a bit. That's kind of funny, because we warned people earlier on this year about the reflation risks, the risk of Brexit, Trump, and all that lining up in the perfect storm. And yet now that we're there and everyone is changing their forecast to higher interest rates, we're like reluctant because we're not quite sure if Trump can make those wages increase in a lasting way. And we believe the fiscal impact is reflationary, sure. But the trade impact is a real problem. And that's where there's just too much uncertainty at the moment. Trump is trying to build a wall against globalization, but there's inevitably going to be holes in that wall. It's not that simple. You can't just work it that way. So here's sort of the factors that I just linked up, right? On the fiscal side, all sorts of positives, but on trade and foreign policy, a lot of unknowns. And even assuming that Trump pulls it off and he achieves some victories, and they're likely to be relatively small, it is a period in which you have a lot of volatility. And maybe you'll find that one of the profound impacts you will have is that if your company's trying to do anything abroad, you'll find the president has time from his bully pulpit to address that, or maybe send a few 3 a.m. tweets at you when he's not too busy focusing on Rosie O'Donnell. So that is something there to watch. I mentioned the Fed. Will they ever normalize? Well, the Fed is now on a very predictable sort of pattern. They do one traditional Christmas hike a year, and that's the cycle. So we're actually expecting them later this month to hike 25 basis point. Consistently, though, They've not been able to deliver on what they themselves think they're going to do. And Fed policy looks a little bit like this. They're trying to build sort of a ammunition for the future, for the next recession that comes around. They don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know when it's going to happen. But we know the recovery is long in the tooth. But they're also aware that as they jump up and down, they've dug that hole very deep. They should have never cut interest rates this deeply. They should have never engaged in such extraordinary monetary stimulus. But now that we're there, they find themselves in a precarious position. Under the circumstances where we have fiscal stimulus, the Fed can do more. But again, it's balanced by that trade uncertainty. So we think they will do only one hike next year. 
One rule that's most likely to change, though, globally is that small government is going to be under pressure. More fiscal stimulus is coming. And for that matter, you, of course, want to look at Japan. It's always at the forefront of this. It is where, if there is going to be helicopter money, the rotors will start sounding first. And you'll hear the sound of the blades. Why is that? Well, think about populism. Think about the establishment. Because that was what the elections in the US were about. That's what it was all about with Brexit, and that's what it's globally about. It's not left versus right, it's not Democrats versus Republicans. Trump ran as much against the Republican Party as he did against the Democrats. But here's the deal. When the populist gets control, he will want to do more fiscal stimulus. And he can use the central banks to fund it if need be. And we'll see what Trump does with the central banks. 2018, he, early 2018, he can replace Janet Yellen. And even this year, he can already fill a few of the seats on the Fed, because they're vacant at the moment. So he can now start making an impact there. But more to the point, either the populists win and there's more fiscal stimulus, or the establishment stays in control, but there's only one way the establishment stays in control, and that's if they sound more like the populists, if they take the, the wind out of their sails. So again, beautiful art by, by Escher here, where you can see in a circle, the figures become indistinguishable. They blend into each other. And in the middle, the angry populist meets with the establishment, and they become indistinguishable. If Hillary Clinton would have won the elections, she wouldn't have been the Hillary Clinton of a few years back. She'd be a Hillary Clinton that would want to renegotiate all trade agreements. So already, Trump had a real impact there, if you may. And the establishment, of course, is good at doing, doing one thing, and that is remaining the establishment. So they will adopt this, and they will spend up as well. So look in the upcoming year for more fiscal stimulus. And possibly, that will help build that reflation trade more meaningfully. We already talked about interest rates there. To recap, we're just not sure we're at that breaking point. We think the sugar hire of the markets is going to be capped by realism on the trade front, and that's an ugly story. But if globally, the anti-globalization trade continues, the reflation trade is on. All right, that's a key message there. When it comes to these messages, to conclude, can we learn anything from China? Because China is an expert at doing monetary and fiscal stimulus at the same time. Well, I know a lot of people have this sort of flying under the radar these days. They say things like, well, the rest of the world is in a pretty place too. In any case, in China, you know, they control the left and the right hand side of the balance sheet. So what could possibly go wrong, Jan? Well, let me think. Soviet Union, what happened to that? Oh, yeah. That could go wrong. A very worrisome chart on the left. Scissor. This is investment in China. The orange line is private investment. It's when you have your own skin in the game. The blue line is state investment. So organized by the government, the banks providing the funds, and the companies investing it. And that's still going up. It's quite a worrisome signal. And you can see on the right-hand side how it's all financed by credit. So domestically, a lot of things have gotten distorted by this joined-up policy. So it's not easy to pull it off. You can do it for a bit, but if you do it consistently, you get these distortions in housing, etc. That's exactly, we're seeing leverage actually take, picking up in China rather than deleveraging like we saw in the rest of the world. And we see that the debt bubble in China is starting to expand. And there's no good economic theory to tell you where debt bubbles stop. But I've listed a few other debt bubbles here in the build-up there. And you can see that China in a few years will approach what the US debt bubble was in 2008. And let's be real here, the Chinese economy doesn't have the strength of the US economy to deal with it. So we seem to be reaching an inflection point to harken back to what was said yesterday. And China should be concerned because it's not just domestically that it has issues, which it may be able to kick the can down the road another five years. The craft, yeah, that. But what about the external front? Protectionism is on the rise. You see, when Mr. Trump or other people talk about that the world's getting a bad deal when they deal with China, this chart seems to suggest that that's indeed true. China is only a net importer in primary commodities and agri materials. In the green stuff is all the rest. From low scale to high scale, they are net exporters at everything. So Angela Merkel visited China in June, and she looks decidedly sad there, because she figured out that step by step the Chinese are trying to eat even the German lunch. So pitted against that, and tongue in cheek, is the mercantilism of the Chinese versus the Merkel cantalism of the Germans. If the Germans are feeling the pressure, then there is a bit of concern there. But let's drill down to a bit more 
guttural chart. This is steel production in the world. 2000, China produces 10 to 15% of world steel. They produce 65% of world steel right now. It's nice to give them access to the WTO. And sure, it's worked out very well for China, but here are some of the ammunition that people against free trade, the anti-globalization tide is using. And I find it hard to look at this chart and think that China shouldn't be somehow a bit reined in. This is quite egregious. The yuan, of course, in such a scenario is under further depreciation pressure. We're looking for 7.6 at the end of next year there. So to wrap it up, we're on this journey, and it's business as usual turning into business as unusual. And there's a few banana peels along the way, and the banana peels we mostly have to pay attention to now are the European elections and referenda coming up. What does it mean for you? Well, it means you're operating still in a low-growth environment. In the US, a little bit better than the rest of the world. Definitely a low-growth environment, low-inflation environment. Central banks will continue to be the juggernauts in the room. Look at the BOJ for the frontier policy, but the other central banks are still out there as well. The Fed won't do much hiking until it's clear what the impact of the Trump presidency really will be. Fiscal stimulus is ahead globally, and that's probably good news. But if it's China-style, we'll have some implications as well. Politically speaking, it's the establishment versus the populism. The establishment versus globalization, anti-globalization in this case. If the populists keep winning, then you can have that sort of breakaway, that reflation trade, more protectionism, higher yields. In any case, the whole lower for longer, you will want to look at your hedging policies again. I know that you've been saying, Jan, and we've listened to this story for a few years already, you always say interest rates are going up, but we've been doing well being all floating. I hope the past couple of weeks have at least shown you that this is a much more volatile environment. We, can, we have the pieces of the puzzle to create a more lasting jump in, 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 in interest rates, even if it's perhaps more than 12 months away. And currency volatility in such an environment is, of course, very high. The key challenge is to actually get wages up, but that will require quite a bit of extraordinary policies, and until that time, we're in this labyrinth by Escher with no visible access there. Thank you very much. We definitely have time for some, uh, some questions. So if anyone has a question, please raise your hand. We'll get a mic to you, because else it's very hard to hear you. I'm trying to keep out a look. By all means, it can be about this presentation, but you're also free to ask me other things. I'll tell you honestly if I don't know. A question over there. As always, uh, Jan, you are brilliant, so thank you. Don't agree with everything you said about President Trump and what to look for, but um, I think you'll be surprised on the upside with some things. What I had a question about, though, is Europe. Um, and, you know, the, we focus on Brexit. We know there's an Austrian election. We know that there's the Italian issue. Uh, the French election's coming up. Fillon is likely to be the president there. What's the chance of Merkel uh, remaining chancellor in Germany, does she have any real competition? And if you had to forecast Europe in the next uh, two years, number one, uh, will the euro go to a, will the dollar go to a premium versus the euro or par? Will it stay at par? Or will uh, Europe uh, resurge again? Starting with the latter, because I promised forecasts, so let's deliver a few more. We talked about the Fed. The ECB, which is, of course, important if you were trying to forecast euro dollar, is going to double down. They'll do more stimulus still in the next year. Um, and they'll find it very hard to end sort of all this accommodative policy, as, even as they talk about trying to provide a roadmap for that. We're looking at euro dollar around 110 by the end of next year. So it's actually a little bit up from here. The euro actually recovering a bit of ground. And again, that is informed by our rates view as well. Currently, the dollar's on a bit of a sugar rush. Everyone's looking at the most positive impact. But if Trump can deliver, and I hope I didn't sound too negative there, because I'm not too negative, I think. But it will be a 2018 story, probably. The uncertainties about trade have to go out of the way, and the fiscal stimulus has to arrive. And it always takes some time to arrive. So at that point, 12 months out, 110. But beyond that, the dollar is going to appreciate again, so then it can slowly start moving towards parity on a, say, two-year horizon. So that's a bit of a complex uh, view, if you may. On Europe. Um, 
and perhaps the first thing you should answer is, well, what is the most important thing to watch? I think actually the German election is the one I'm less worried about. I'm not so sure if Merkel is going to manage that fourth term. She's under a lot of pressure, so I think there's definitely room for a backlash. But the populist forces in Germany are not organized well enough, I've got to be careful here, they're not organized well enough to really seize control. Where I'm most worried is France. We had a conference call last week in a team, and one of our analysts went on and said, like, well, Filon is good news, he's a reformist, um, you know, a whole list of good, good things. Good things, I don't, nothing to understand. At the end of that one minute of good things about Filon, it was deadly silence on the call, and a couple of analysts, including myself, at the same time said, okay, now I'm worried. Because if we have Marie Le Pen, the populist, running against a reformist who's promising only pain, then maybe she does have a chance to win, right? Maybe it can twist. But then again, tongue in cheek, when the whole world was reforming, the French were populist, so maybe when the whole world's populist, the French are going to reform. Who knows? Italian referendum this weekend is something to bear watching, mostly because a no vote may rattle the cage of the banks. The no vote, though, is very complicated. The reforms would actually be in the favor of the populists because the reforms, the electoral reforms, would make it easier for one party to gain a majority. But a no vote is seen as Renzi leaving, uncertainty. Uh, Italy has had 63 governments in 69 years. Renzi has now been there three years, so he's a pillar of stability in the Italian landscape for that matter. When he did these, these plans two years ago, he was the biggest party and he thought it was all a great idea. Now it all pans out differently. One thing to bear in mind, a lot of people think the Italian referendum is an in or out referendum on the Euro. That's not the case. Will, can it follow? Very difficult. In the Italian constitution, Article 75, I'll bore you a little bit, it is explicitly banned to have in or out referendums on international treaties. So you can't even have it, you'd have, need a constitutional change, and I think we're about to find out constitutional changes in Italy are quite difficult. Thank you, Carol, really good questions. Anyone else? If you can get a mic there. You highlight in your presentation uh, the, the, one of the main issues being uh, um, the lack of wage, wage growth. What changes that? Yeah, of course, the gentleman is absolutely well exposing that I'm better at naming the problems than solving them. Um, this is the big puzzle. Why are wages under pressure? I've mentioned globalization, but of course technology is also a part of the role there. Vasily Leontjev said in the 80s, the horse never quite recovered from the invention of the tractor. So we're, we've replaced human labor power already. We're at risk of also replacing human brain power in the upcoming decades, and that exacerbates these trends that we're seeing. So globalization, technology, are all forces that are really keeping wages down. How can we change this? Well, it's an undeniable fact uh, economic fear has no good distribution between capital and the rewards of capital and labor and the rewards of labor. Labor, because it's become more abundant and imperiled by machines, has been under pressure. But we need to figure out a way to rejig that. The difficulty is, of course, if you rejig it the wrong way, then people all have the incentives for bad behavior. This is the classic argument there. But we need to find a way to increase these wages. Um, I think we are trying globally by, for example, increasing minimum wages or living wage in the UK that we've seen. Um, I think the Trump administration believes that through at least going into some of these trade deals and renegotiating them, there's room here for improvement. Um, I hope I've shown with a few charts that this is not a black and white story. Right? If you look at how China has been benefiting from the WTO, maybe it is good to try and, and extract some things there. The best way, of course, would be if we can grow the pie, if we can have the technological growth, the, the, the labor productivity, and then distribute that. So much easier to distribute from a growing pie rather than having to take it from Peter to give to Paul. And that would require ending these extraordinary monetary policies and getting companies back into the right incentives rather than a complete financialization of our economy. So these are some of the avenues they can choose, but it's a real challenge. Any last question there? In the back. Is there any chance that the Fed takes advantage of the Trump bubble and raises 50 basis points this month? 
It would be a bold move. I don't think they will do that. But the market does believe that we're in for a series of rate hikes next year. And that is a very recent affair that they started to price that in. That is the sugar rush, it's the fiscal stimulus coming through. And to be fair, well, business can get done. The Republicans have a working plan out there. They've been sitting on it for years. Paul Ryan is probably the only one out there with a working plan that he wants to implement. And Trump could let him roll with it. So that could arrive. It's just that that trade uncertainty is keeping it capped. And that, in our mind, balances to where the Fed says, OK, we're going to sit on our hands for a little bit and see how this pans out. But I don't think they'll hike 50 basis points this month. There is a risk that if the trade story is handled well and that becomes visible quite clear, quickly, that the Fed is able to hike more. They definitely want to hike more because, like we saw, they think the next recession may just be around the corner at some point in the upcoming years, and they want to get some rate maneuvering space in between them and that next recession. Thank you for the question, and thank you all very much.